the tuning issue you never knew you had. This is probably going to be a pretty long video, so bear with me. Right? We've got a lot of ground to cover. And before I even do that, we got to throw a couple of disclaimers out there. First is that for the context of this video, for the context of this discussion, we're talking about something that the average guy building the average engine on an average budget is going to deal with, right? This is for the home builder. This isn't for the, for, you know, you're not building Maseratis or, or, or Indy 500 or top fuel motors. We're talking about typical street guy building a typical street engine. And also, we're going to be using a, a Chrysler for illustrative purposes, but these principles apply across the board. This applies to every engine. So don't get like, you know, oh, it's only a Mopars. No, this is across the board. So before we dig into the nuts and bolts of it, first we have to do a little history. If you go back to the very earliest days of the American high performance scene, right, 1960, 61, 62, like that, in that range, there were two reputations that evolved at that point that were absolutely true and still hold true today. And that's it. First one is the small block Chevy. The small block Chevy is the cheapest, easiest way to get good, solid street and strip performance, affordable, solid street and strip performance. The big block Chevy as well, but the small block Chevy is the one that that reputation was earned by. The other reputation is that Mopars can run really hard as long as they're put together by somebody who knows what they're doing. And that's, that's also true. Most Mopars run decent out of the box, you know, the way they, they, were, they were built. But then as soon as you start modifying them, as soon as you crack them open and start changing things around, now unless you know what you're doing with these engines, more often than not, you end up with a turd. Why is that? And this is a situation that has confounded tens of thousands of guys over the decades, where they'll take their car, their, their Chrysler product, or it could be a Ford, could be an Oldsmobile, could be anything, right? They'll take one of these cars and they'll throw everything. It starts off running decent. It's a good running car. And they throw the book at it, right? Headers, intake, carburetor, cam, lifters, matched valve springs and the whole bit. And they, and they, they, they deck the block. You know, they have it all trued. And they, they cut the heads. They do all the stuff they're supposed to do. Now they bolt it all together and the car doesn't run any better than it did before. Why? It gets to around 5,000, 5,500 RPM, and it just flattens out. It won't pull any further past that. And they will go crazy trying to tune the issue out of this. It's jetting. It's the wrong carburetor. It's a distributor issue. It's this issue. It's that issue. It's the other issue. But it's none of those things. It's, and it's the very thing that sets the Chevys apart from the Chryslers, right? And you know what the difference is, right? Okay, ready for this one? It's in the rocker arms. It's in the design of the valve train. Chevy engines, whether they're hydraulic or solid lifter, are all designed, they're all built with, and I'm, I'm not talking about late motors, I'm talking about the traditional ones. The small block Chevy, all of them have a ball stud rocker arrangement, meaning that they're all individually adjustable. So when you set one of these engines up for high performance, you set the thing for zero lash, this is assuming a hydraulic cam, and, and for the context of this video, we're talking about hydraulic motors. You set it for zero lash, zero preload, and now you take full advantage of whatever breathing capabilities that engine has. So they'll pull to 6,500, 7,000 RPM clean. They work really good. The Chrysler, on the other hand, once you start making any modifications to the engine, the lifter preload that's built into the valve train, and again, not just Chrysler's, this is anything with a fixed rocker, the preload that's built into the valve train to keep it all tight and, and keep it from ticking, that starts working against you. You end up with floating valves, and as soon as the valves float a little bit, the lifters pump up, aggravates the situation, and boom, the motor just falls on its face and won't make any power. So why is there preload? What is preload and why do you have preload? So the stated reason, the engineering reason for having preload is that as the engine goes through its cooling, its, its cold to hot cycle, relationships change. Things expand and contract and, and whatnot. And that's why you have lash that's on, a, on a solid motor. That's why you have lash to compensate for those changes. 
On a hydraulic motor, you don't have lash. You have the, the hydraulic cushion of the lifter to make up for that. So that's why the preload is, is how far the push rod is down in the lifter, below the surface of the lifter. And that compensates for the expansion and contraction and keeps all of the, the relationships between the valve stem, the rocker, the push rod, and the lifter, and the cam keeps them all tight. That's the stated engineering reason. The factual reason is that from a production standpoint, there are so many variations and so much slop in the typical assembly line built engine that preload compensates for all of those variables. All right, so I'm going to show you a perfect example of this. This is, this is a set of push rods that I pulled out of a 383. Okay, they all came from the same engine. So now here we've got them all lined up against this. And if we go down this side, we see, let me get out of the shadow here. We see that we have gaps. The largest of them is this one right here, which, okay, I, it's hard to do this with, with two hands and hold the camera. The largest of these gaps is 18 thousandths of an inch. Sorry for, the, sorry for the, uh, the sloppy work, but you know, it is what it is. You get the general idea. So that's the, this push rod here is the shortest of the bunch by 18 thousandths of an inch over the average. There are others in here that are five thousandths, eight thousandths, shorter, and, and so, so you've got the gamut, you've got the range. So how do you compensate for this slop that's in the factory parts? Well, you put preload. You have it so that the push rod is pushed down into the lifter and the hydraulic cushion keeps everything together. It's like the great equalizer. Now, here's another example on the cylinder heads. So here, we just finished putting these things together, okay? And we have one, one stem that's higher than the others. Okay, so this one's this one is higher by I believe it was fourteen thousandths of an inch when I measured it. They're not they're not all exact. They never are. And if you say, well, okay, well that's because you're using old junk cylinder heads, and you know there's going to be all kinds of variations. Well, here is a brand new out of the out of the box Edelbrock head that's never been worked on, never been taken apart, never modified. And look what we have here. I lay my straight edge over this stem right here and look what I can do. Okay, that's right out of the box. Now if you take a stamped steel rocker mounted on a shaft, non-adjustable, this stem, this higher stem is going to cause greater preload in the lifter than the other ones. So this one here has a higher likelihood of floating, of, of getting pumped up. Okay, so let's talk about pump up. So, the lifter, the job of a hydraulic lifter and the reason for the preload is to keep everything tight. All of these relationships from the valve stem, the rocker, the push rod, the lifter, and the cam all have to be maintained at zero, at least zero, so that there's no noise, there's no slop. All right, as the engine RPM picks up, the valve doesn't want necessarily want to return to its seat. The, the inertia is holding the valve open, or trying to hold the valve open. The valve spring, its job is to overcome the inertia and send the valve back out again and follow the contour of the camshaft. So as the cam comes around on, onto its closing ramp, the valve spring has to keep tension between all of these components. But at higher RPM, valve springs, they start to, they do weird things. They oscillate. They, they, you, you got to see a high speed film of a valve spring in action to understand what I'm talking about. And the higher the RPM, the more inertia there is in the valve. So the valve has been shoved all the way open and now it's being relieved because the, the cam is on its closing ramp, and it doesn't necessarily want to change direction instantly. It's going to want to keep going, and then it's going to want to linger before the spring can actually start pulling it back up and keep tension all over here. So 
what happens now is that the lifter starts doing exactly what the lifter is designed to do, take up slack. So you get to, let's say, 5,000, 5,500 RPM with a setup like this, and now you've got, let's say, maybe a thousandth of an inch of slack in there. Okay, so what happens is the lifter does what it's supposed to and it brings more, allows more oil in to take up that slack. The higher the RPM, the more that slack becomes, the more oil goes into the lifter and it starts pumping up the valve train and not allowing the valve to return to its seat. And with that, your dynamic compression goes away. That's valve float. They have anti-pump up lifters. There is a thing called an anti-pump up lifter where the internal clearances are different than a standard lifter. But honestly, they're hit and miss. And in a really bad situation where you've got, let's say, very high RPM, very aggressive ramps, uh, heavy valves, even they won't really do the job. They'll still pump up somewhat and kill that higher RPM power. So what do you do with something like this? What do you do with this situation? Well, the, obviously, the best way to go about it is to spring for a set of adjustable rockers. And then on your performance engine, set it for zero lash, zero preload, and let her sing. It's not always practical, though. First off, quality adjustable rockers are not cheap, especially for certain engines. You could spend a, a good bit of coin. You could spend more money on, on setting up the valve train between the push rods and the rockers and everything than you'll have in the rest of the motor. You want, and you want to buy quality stuff for that. And then also, there's, they're not available for all engines. And this situation exists for all engines. So it's not always possible to go with an adjustable rocker. But that is your best bet. That is the, the, the best fix. Now, in our situation, like I said, we do everything the way we perceive the home engine builder will do it. And we do everything that we perceive that somebody who's working on a working man's budget, you know, and I was like, you've got to just sneak away a few bucks here and there to, to spend on your hot rod. You know, you can't, you, don't just, you can't just like, you know, here, flash the plastic and buy whatever you want. We do everything on this channel based on that idea. So in, that's why we're on this engine, we're sticking with the stock rockers and the stock push rods. So I'm going to show you some of the things that we're doing to compensate for this. Oh, I got to throw one other thing in there too. And that's it. When you do the right thing by an engine, okay, so you send it off to the machine shop and you have it decked. And let's say they take 10, 15, 20 thousandths off the deck. And maybe you're going for a little extra compression on the cylinder head. So you have that cut. You know, it's either just surfaced, you know, five, 10 thousandths surface, or you actually have a cut, 10, 20, 30 thousandths. When you change that relationship now between the deck and the head and you shorten it, you're only aggravating this situation right here. So let's just say this. If you do any modifications to the deck or, or the, the head surface where you're taking any, any substantial amount of metal off of it, 10, 20, 30 thousandths of an inch, or even if you're changing head gasket thicknesses, this preload over here, which is generally from the factory set at between 15 and 30 thousandths of an inch, thereabouts, becomes extreme. So if you take, if, if this starts off at 20 thousandths of an inch and you take a combined 30 thousandths off the head and the deck, now you've got a 50 thousandths preload. The, fur, the more preload, the more likelihood at, and at an earlier lower RPM, the more likelihood it is to float the valves and give you that just squash performance. So keep that in mind. Anytime you do any serious modifications to the deck surface, the distance between the cylinder head and the block, that has to be compensated for. And if you've gone that far, then yeah, put a set of adjustable rockers on it. Spring for a set of adjustable rockers. So in our situation here, what we're doing is we're equalizing things as best we can. And Al was in here yesterday, I was, I was screwing around with the valve train, and I says, Al, listen, if you ever crack open an engine that I put together, and I don't mean a street, like I don't mean like a regular daily driver engine, like for instance, something that you just goes out on the street and it's like, you know, it's, it's something that you drive every day. This stuff really doesn't count. This only matters when you're trying to get real performance out of it, higher end, higher RPM performance. For a regular daily driver, street type of car, you're never gonna see a difference.
You know, so just keep that in mind. Like, don't, you know, if, you, if you're just building something for, for cars and coffee and cruise nights and it'll never see the sweet side of like, you know, 5,000 RPM, don't give this, don't stress this stuff. You'll be just fine. But if you're building for performance, that's where this stuff is, is crucial. So I told Al, I says, Al, if you ever crack open an engine that I built for, for performance, right, never mix up the push rods. Right? Make sure the push rods go in exactly the same spot. You know, typically, if you take apart an engine, a factory engine, that's all built with factory parts and factory production tolerances, it doesn't matter where you put the push rods. Just, just take them all out, put them on a pile, and when you're done, drop them all back in. Right? No problem. But when you do a, a, a setup like I'm doing on this, then every push rod has a home. You know what I mean? You can't mix them up because here's, and here's a perfect example, on this one... This one uh, stem that's higher than the others, I'm going to use the shortest of these push rods. And I'll make a mark on them that I'll know what that mark is. You may not, you know, you take this thing apart yourself, you're not going to know what these marks mean. But I'll put those notations on the different parts for myself. And I know that this push rod goes into this spot, even though they, they look all the same, there are those small differences, and then you're stacking tolerances. So I'm gonna compensate for the tall stem with a short push rod. Here's another thing I'm doing right here, is that I'm attempting now to find as close to zero lash as possible. So I've got the head, zero, did I say lash? I'm looking to, to get as close to zero preload zero lash as possible so i've got the head with a gasket bolted to the block i got my cam in here and the cam is on its base circle the lifter is in there push rod and the rocker and what i've done here is i set the rocker down i, I took these two bolts and i tightened them down until i had zero lash zero preload then right and i measured it then i took these bolts and i ran them down and i found the distance of preload. This is how I found, there's many different ways to do it, but this is how I found my distance of, of preload. So now I know that there's a 20 thousandths preload in this situation. So I'm gonna add a 20 thousandths shim under these rockers to even it out. Now, once I, once I assemble the whole motor, I may find that it, it's not exactly, you know, side to side, it's not gonna be the same. As we mentioned when we, uh, we did the, the the piston video on this engine. We've got the deck is, is different. We've got this back end of the deck is five thousandths of an inch shorter than this. And this side is four thousandths shorter. And all of that has to be taken into consideration when I'm placing my push rods and when I'm shimming the rockers. This stuff takes a lot of time. It's very tedious. You have to be a little nuts to do all of this stuff especially when you can not worry about it by buying a set of rockers and, and call it a day. But I enjoy the challenge. I, I like making these things run good with stock parts. And if you follow this channel, I, I, I'm sure you're, you're of the same mindset. It's like, yeah, come on, let's make this, let's get the most that we can out of these junk parts. And that's what we're doing over here. So at any rate, I hope you got something out of that and I'll see you tomorrow.